Thanks so much, uh, Zolani. Um, <laughs> those, those mission trips certainly stretch you. Uh, that's for sure. The, everyone's faith grows. I remember that crocodile. <laughs> we, were, we were right next to this lake, and this crocodile was swimming around there. <laughs> that was an epic. That particular mission trip was especially challenging. Uh, anyway, I, I, I just want to say it's always a privilege to, to just meet and worship with the household of God. Uh, it's an especial privilege to be invited to be a downpipe to preach the word. Uh, but it's an extraordinary privilege to be invited to this particular church because uh, our relationship, Jill and, uh, and, and our, my relationship with Sarepta, goes back almost to the beginnings of Sarepta. Uh, we moved into Gillis in 1973, which was, and I believe uh, Dave was saying, you just celebrated your 50th anniversary last year. So, so there we go. And, and, uh, and we, uh, we met up firstly with Ken and Faye. Ken Balcom was holding a Bible study in our house with a mixed bunch of women from different churches. And uh, then, then uh, I got to know Jonathan particularly. And I don't know if you know, but Jonathan is, is one of my spiritual fathers. I, I number three men as, as my spiritual fathers, uh, men who were just further down the, the trail, the maturity trail than I was, and, uh, and who taught me things I needed to, to learn. And uh, the other two have died some years back. And Jonathan, of course, is right at this moment in the departure lounge, so to speak. And uh, Jill and I uh, visited him just two weeks ago. I uh, just had a prompting to go and, and sing to Jonathan. So I took my guitar, and, and he was quite lucid, actually, because he'd, there, were, there were sort of talks of him, you know, having a bit of dementia. But in fact, they'd, they'd found some, some, uh, some infection, they'd given him some antibiotics, and that it cleared his brain and he was completely lucid. But of course, he's been trying to die for at least a decade. Uh, his favorite verse is the one from Philippians where Paul says, it is better to die and depart and be with Christ. Except it doesn't say that quite. Uh, in fact, I think Jonathan's last birthday, I sent a message to him and say, you know, if it's better to die and be with Christ, what are you doing hanging around? So he wrote back and said, it's far better to die and be with Christ. F-A-A-A-R. <laughs> anyway, I think his time has come. And uh, it's been such a joy and a privilege. I cannot tell you how much of an impact Sarepta Church has had on Jill and, and myself, although we've never been members here. Jill would have loved to be a member. If, if the Lord had let her, she would have been here like a shot. And uh, I think... I think we were both sort of slot right in here because there's a particular kind of delightful craziness which, which describes Sarepta Church. I, I don't know if I see people smiling. Um, I remember when, when Frank handed the baton, oh, Frank in the UK was sort of giving apostolic over, handed the baton to Costa Mitchell. He said, they are different. <laughs> and so... Uh, can I say, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary privilege to be here. Uh, you are different in the most unique and delightful and godly way. And so I thank God for you. I want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, I just want to say a couple of thank yous. Thank, yous to the, thank you to the team who led us so beautifully into the throne room of heaven. That was really, really wonderful. It's very easy to, to teach and preach after that. Thank you also to Amanda for that salutary word about Israel, which is absolutely right on the button. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Now, um, I'm going to be teaching, I'm more of a teacher than a preacher, on Ephesians 4, which has been much taught on. But um, perhaps you could turn to Ephesians 4. Jill's actually going to read first from the J.B. Phillips paraphrase. So it'll sound a little different to your version, but uh, it's a very graceful 
paraphrase, J.B. Phillips was actually a classical Greek scholar and he's an Englishman. So it reads rather more gracefully than something like the message. And uh, so Ephesians 4, uh, first 16 verses, which in fact is, it describes the anatomy and the functioning of a healthy church. The anatomy and functioning of a healthy church. Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. Thanks, babe. There's one thing I want to say before I, I read. Um, this is a lot about the body and the, how we're all gifted differently. And it thrills my heart that um, the boys there behind the desk are developing and using gifts that they probably had to um, acquire skills for. And I just want to say that Nigel, I know particularly well, and he has many other gifts because he, I know because he's been on mission with us. And one of them is a gift of service. And he's particularly good at cooking. Did you know that? <laughs> so it is, it's, it's thrilling. It's a very practical passage, this. And um, the, the first part, though, is called in, in this version I'm reading, which is Philip's, Christians should be at one as God is one. As God's prisoner, then, I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling. Accept life with humility and patience, making allowances for each other because you love each other. Make it your aim to be one in the spirit. And you will inevitably be at peace with one another. You all belong to one body of which there is one spirit. Just as you all experienced one calling to one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all, who is the one over all, the one working through all, and the one living in all. The next little section is called God's Gifts Vary but it is the same God who gives. Naturally, there are different gifts and functions. Individually, grace is given to us in different ways, out of the rich diversity of Christ's giving. As the scripture said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. His gifts unto men were varied, some he made his messengers, some prophets, some preachers of the gospel. To some he gave the power to guide and teach his people. His gifts were made that Christians might be properly equipped for their service, that the whole body might be built up until the time comes when in the unity of common faith and common knowledge of the Son of God, we arrive at real maturity. That measure of development, which is meant by the fullness of Christ. And then the last section is called true maturity, means growing up into Christ. We are not meant to remain as children at the mercy of every chance wind of teaching and the jockeying of men who are expert in the crafty presentation of lies, but we are meant to hold firmly to the truth in love and to grow up in every way into Christ, the head. For it is from the head that the whole body, as a harmonious structure knit together by the joints with which it is provided, grows by the proper functioning of individual parts of its full maturity in love. Amen. Thanks, babe. This is the word of God. Now, it's quite nice when the preacher says, this is the word of God to say, thanks be to God. It's a kind of an Anglican story, actually. Can we do that? This is the word of God. Now, this passage has been much preached on uh, over the past three decades. Um, it says a lot about unity. In fact, uh, 
in, in the previous chapter, it talks about how Jesus has broken down the, the middle wall of partition. Now, I'm, gonna do, now I'm not going to do a, a verse-by-verse verse exposition of, of these verses, but I want you to note in verse 3, it talks about maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. You see, the, the unity of the Spirit is something which we have between ourselves and other believers who are, have been born of the Spirit. It kind of makes sense. If you're born of the Spirit, you'll have a unity of the Spirit with other believers. But that kind of unity does need maintenance. Sometimes there, there kind of comes discords and tensions with other believers. you ever had that at all in Sarepta occasionally? Um, and so it needs maintenance. Sometimes it needs a lot of maintenance. And it, it not a lot of hard work. But we, we have to work at maintaining the unity of the Spirit. But it is something we, we have just by being born again. Further down, in verse 13, it talks about a different kind of unity, the unity of the faith, unity of the faith, and that we do not yet have. It says we have to attain to the unity of the faith. So if you can get this, that right, two kinds of unity in this passage, unity of the spirit, which we have, but which needs maintenance, the unity of the faith, which we do not yet have, but we are supposed to shoot for it, stretch for it. You know, Paul in, in, uh, in uh, Philippians uh, says, I, I, I do not consider myself to have arrived. Even Paul, the great apostle Paul, was still on this journey. He said, nevertheless, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So this thing, the, 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 the unity of the faith, is something we are meant to stretch for and press for with all that is in us. Okay. Now then it describes what that term means, unity of the faith. It actually is, defi it is defined in terms of Christ-likeness. It's when we attain to maturity in Christ, that's when we have attained unity of the faith. And it's got this lovely phrase, um, I did a lot of my memorizing in the Revised Standard Version. It says, until we attain to the, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. I just love all those. The, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. That's what we're shooting for. Complete Christ-likeness. Okay. So that's known as spiritual maturity. Uh, it's not enough to be spiritual. Lots of people can be spiritual. The Sangoma can be spiritual. A Hindu can be spiritual. A Muslim can be spiritual. Satan is spiritual. But we are supposed to be spiritually mature. And that's a totally different thing. Like a lot of people trying to be spiritual. No, don't try to be spiritual. Spiritually mature. Spiritual maturity is what we're shooting for. And I'm just going to take a little sip of water. So we're all on this journey. It's a kind of a comrade's marathon, really. It's a race, described as a race sometimes. But certainly it's a journey. The technical term is, is sanctification. We're all the, on the sanctification trail. Um, we are in Christ from the moment of conversion. By faith, we are justified. But the, this, the process of sanctification takes us our whole lifetime. According to 1 John 3, it's only when we finally meet Jesus, we will have become like him. It, says, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when we meet him, we shall see him face to face and we shall have become like him. It's a kind of a, a miraculous thing, which I don't properly understand. But what we need to be about, if you like, is closing the gap while we're alive. And uh, 
So, okay, we're all on this journey, and the lovely thing is we're on it together, and we help each other, and we minister to one another. And so, sandwiched between those two kinds of unity in this passage is all about ministries. The fivefold ministry, we've heard all about those, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And those are particularly, they're called ascension ministries or equipping ministries. They are there to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So it's not, it's not just for the super saints and the, the guys up front to be doing the ministry. Everybody gets to play in the healthy church. Okay, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That's anyone can do something in the church of God to build it up because we're talking not about a, an individual journey, talking about a collective maturity of the whole body. Making sense? Can we have a little Pentecostal amen or something there? Okay, you're with us. All right. Now, I don't know if you anything like me, but I'd kind of like some hints from God as to how am I doing on this journey? Like, you know, if you're at school, you, you write exams or you write projects and get a mark. Um, so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to, I'm going to set, give you a, a self-diagnostic test. How does that sound? Does that sound a bit scary? I just, I, there's sort of movements of nervousness around the church at this point. Don't, don't, be, don't be nervous. Um, what I'm going to do is just single out five markers of maturity. Five markers of maturity. And you can just test yourself. I'll tease them out a bit so you understand them better. You know, uh, in the Methodist church, a good sermon is supposed to be introduction, three points and a conclusion. But I'm not in a Methodist church now. I'm here, so I'm letting my hair down. I've got five points. <laughs> so, so. And uh, Zolani's given, given me a license to preach for two hours, eh? Now you're really nervous. Okay. Um, the first mark or marker of spiritual maturity is how much we complain. Okay. Uh, complaining is a kind of a South African habit, actually, isn't it? We complain about the load shedding. We complain about the ANC. We complain, complain about... Yes, can we complain about the medical service, complain about the EFF? We, we just actually, I think, we tend to be a nation of whingers. Now, I, I, want, I want to say a couple of little caveats here. It, it's legitimate to lament. Lamenting is a, a legitimate form. You'll find it in the Psalms. To say, Lord, I'm really struggling here. I'm struggling with illness. I'm struggling with my finances. Um, I'm struggling with my relationship, with my spouse, with my kids, with my employees, my employer. A, a lament is okay. But I'm not talking about a lament. I'm talking about an attitude which says, somebody, somewhere, should be making my life more comfortable. You get that? And I'm going to give you three biblical reasons to back the statement I'm just going to make now. Listen carefully for this statement. To complain about anything or anyone at any time is a sin. Somebody's nodding their head like they agree, but there's a lot of silence also around here. It's okay to lament. It's okay to speak out against unrighteousness. That's a prophetic role which the church has. But we don't speak out against unrighteousness because it happens to inconvenience us and make our lives uncomfortable. We can expect, if we're walking the Christian talk and talking the walk, it's going to be uncomfortable. 
It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle. And it's not comfortable, particularly on a battlefront. You take some, some battle scars. Don't complain about that when in a battle. And of course, Jesus is our benchmark. It's Christ-likeness we're shooting for. You will not find any record of Jesus complaining. Read the four Gospels. And if anyone had grounds for complaining, it was Jesus. He lived a sinful, sinless life. And just look at him on the way to the cross. So that's the first marker. And can you just score yourself on a scale of 1 to 10? So, so 1 is really bad. You, uh, and 10 is, no, I'm not so, not so bad. It's interesting, one of these mission trips that uh, Solani is telling you about, we took our 11-year-old grandson. And 11-year-olds whinge, man. That's what they do. And um, I happened to ministering on a similar thing at one of the Mozambique churches. And um, little Caleb listened to this. And he, you know, he took it seriously. <laughs> and um, he said later at the mission, he said, um, Granddad, I think when I came here, I would have scored myself about a three on that. He's very honest. Uh, but he said, no, I think, I think I'm up at around about seven. <laughs> so the nice thing about a, a diagnostic, it tells you what we need to work on. And of course, it's Jesus who works in us to produce these fruits. It's a fruit. All right, that's marker number one. Four to go. How are you doing? Hanging in there? Is this useful? Okay. Marker number two is how easily we take offense. How easily we take offense. The interesting thing about Jesus and his ministry, he never opened his mouth, but that he gave offense to somebody. Remember when he, 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 he read from the scroll in Isaiah at, at his home synagogue in Nazareth? And the first people were, thought, oh, here's our homeboy. Just listen how beautifully he reads. And then he started uh, saying some positive things about the Gentiles. They wanted to throw him over a cliff. They were mad. They were absolutely wild. They were seriously offended. And that happened right through his ministry. He, was, he gave offense to the, to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to everybody. In fact, the only people who weren't really offended by him was the sinners. The sinners and the prostitutes and that lot, because they kind of, they, they knew they weren't great. And so they, there was nothing to be offended about. Uh, we get offended when we think we're better than we are. And I remember something Jonathan said, uh, you know, in Romans 6, it says we, we die with Christ and rise to newness of life where sin no longer has dominion over us. It says if you get, if you get offended, it means you haven't died properly because a corpse can't get offended. That makes sense. Okay. Trish, you're nodding your head. That's very encouraging. Thanks. Um, so... Uh, and I read a little quote. It says, there's far more damage done in this world by those who take offense than by those who give offense. The gospel is an offense, the word of God says. So, look, we don't go around just treading on bunions non indiscriminately. We, we, we don't, you know, we, we're not supposed to be obnoxious people. We're supposed to be nice. Uh, in fact, we've got a, a sort of a, a pact with close friends of ours. You now, sometimes people, the older they get, get more and more crusty, like they have a license to just be irritable and so on. Uh, we just said to our friends, look, if you catch us doing any of that stuff, just, just give us a smack, you know. 
So we're supposed to be getting more and more Christ-like the older we get. All right. I haven't lost my thread there. So, so score yourself one to ten. How easily do I take offense? You know, I think, you know, this, this, you know that expression uh, to have one's nose out of joint? Okay, that means you, you're offended. You, someone gets the praise where you think you should have got it, or someone says something which belittles you. Um, the cure for that, actually, is to be very secure in one's sonship. Sonship applies to, to, to men and women. Um, if you know that you're a son, that you're a daughter, it doesn't matter what people throw at you. It doesn't matter how much you get overtaken in the, when the praises are handed out. Uh, it doesn't matter how much you get passed over. It doesn't matter how much you get criticized. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. You cannot take that away from me. And that, that allows me to handle any kind of offensive treatment. Score yourself one to ten. If you take offense easily, you write down at the bottom end of the scale. Right. Grace is the next is the next marker. We all know we're saved by grace through faith. Not as a, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. This is also Ephesians, Ephesians two, eight and nine. Not of works lest any man should boast. We know that. We know that we're saved not of anything we do. We're saved by virtue of the merits of Christ. That should spill over into the way we conduct our lives. We need to walk with a profound sense of, of God's grace every minute of every day. And that means we will teach, we will treat others graciously. You see, uh, we very easily keep a score of wrongs. Uh, you know, we, we very easily cut, make a catalog of the, of the shortcomings of the people that we happen to, to have to do with, rub up against. Um, but God doesn't do that. He's, he's, he's canceled the charge sheet. And yet so easily we, we are not gracious to others. We, we, if, they, if they are unkind to us or if we just see them behaving badly, particularly if they're unkind to us, belittle us, man, we, we rack up a little catalog of their shortcomings. And that can be so harmful in our Christian walk. You know, Hebrews, Hebrews 12 says, some having missed the grace of God have allowed a root of bitterness to spring up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, I know about that stuff. Set one to catch one. I had at one stage a root of bitterness. There's someone who I felt had wronged me, and I nursed a grievance against them, and I rehearsed it and nursed it, and it grew till I had this knot of resentment down me, and I just saw a catalog of his sins. And I had missed the grace of God. And my spiritual walk just went down, 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 down. Uh, my poor wife was witnessed this. And she could see, I mean, you always have grounds for this. But, man, it's not helpful. As, as, as God has canceled the charge sheet, we need to cancel the charge sheets and others. That's why when you pray the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's the only part of the Lord's Prayer which is qualified. If you do not forgive others, you cut yourself off from God's forgiveness. Score yourself out of 10. I'm speaking particularly on this one to someone 
who has been deeply hurt and, and wronged and is really struggling to, to overcome the sense of resentment. If I, if I can just give you a little bit of a lifeline there. For me, deliverance from the root of bitterness which had sprung up in me came when I prayed the Lord's Prayer and prayed it over and over until I really meant the line which says, forgive me my sin as I forgive him sin against me. Eventually, I don't know how long I prayed that prayer, but, but wonderfully the Lord plucked up that root. And I, I struggled after that to even think how I'd been wronged. Uh, it was interesting. It was a miracle. It was, for me, much more miraculous than the phys physical healing. Okay, so that's the third thing. We've had complaints, offense, grace, and, and flowing out of grace is G for generosity. I, I tried to get a mnemonic, which, but it just didn't work. I got cog, and then it, the wheels fell off after that. So I've got another G, cog. G. Uh, generosity. Uh, we, were, we were just praying before the service, and Anne Eagle was, was saying, oh, God is so generous. He is, he is generous beyond imagining. He has given us in Jesus everything. We are heirs of the Father, joint heirs with the Son. We, we serve a generous God, and that needs to be reflected in, 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 in our a generous nature on the part of believers. Now, I need to say, uh, I score myself about a three on this one. It's a growing edge for me. I scored Jill uh, right up there, probably a 10. She has a naturally generous spirit, and so she's mentoring me. I think I'm getting better. Am I getting better, babes? Yes, I hope so. Um, so, so I kind of... I've got some Yorkshire blood in me, and you know, Yorkshire, you know, they count the pennies. And, uh, and um, anyway, but I think I'm getting better. And, and so it's a helpful diagnostic for me that, that Christians are meant to have a generous spirit. And that's why when, when we put our money in the basket here, it's just a response to God's generosity. It's not that the church needs our money. We are the church. It's not that Zolani needs the money. It does need a bit of money, I suppose, but. <laughs> Um, we, we give because God has given us. Uh, so generosity is a marker for Christian maturity. Okay, and then the last one. How am I doing time-wise? I'm all right. I've got a lesson for two hours, eh? <laughs> I won't be long. Uh, truth. See, the, the, uh, if you read these... These 16 verses, it, uh, it gives the, the modus of, it, give, it gives the way in which we keep growing. Uh, it's used this term, this term, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him who is the head. That's how the verse goes. Speaking the truth in love. Now, there's often a tendency to trade love off against truth. We must not do that. Uh, this whole passage starts with love, it ends with love, saturated with love. But that's a key phrase, speaking the truth in love. You see, when, when Jesus comes, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. And when he prays for unity in John 17 what's known as the great high priestly prayer. He says, sanctify them in the truth. He's praying for our unity, okay, that they may be one as I and the Father are one. But the key note to that is sanctify them in the truth. When he speaks to the woman in the well, at the well, he says, the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So this passage, if you, if you, Read about where we, uh, where we, just beyond where it says, 
uh, until we attain to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Jesus Christ, so that we may no longer be infants tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And you, you, you do get a lot of Christians who have been walking with the Lord a long time, but who do not know their Bibles, do not know what constitutes sound doctrine, who are not able to like, engage with a Jehovah's Witness and, and know where their doctrine is untrue. It's very important that we know sound doctrine. It's, it's, not, it's, it's good to memorize scripture. It's good to be reading scripture regularly, and, and not just a verse or two, but a chapter, perhaps, every day. Um, I, I've got quite a good working knowledge of the Bible, and it, people are a bit surprised. That it's not because I spend hours every, every day. It's a little and often thing. Sometimes as little as five minutes, but it's a regular th thing of just walking in the word, reflecting on the word. But more than that, we need to understand the, those sound doctrines which are framed from Scripture. So in particular, you want to be reading uh, the, what's known as the didactic epistles, like Romans and, and Galatians, which are setting forth uh, doctrine, Romans especially. So, so that's, the, that's the fifth marker, okay? The marker of truth, uh, scriptural and doctrinal truth. So score yourself out of 10. How are you doing? Okay, so now um, I'm closing off now. And I, the last thing I want to do this morning is kind of lay a guilt trip on you. I really don't want to do that. Uh, I want to just encourage you. And so this is meant to be an encouraging message, but um, that a diagnostic like this just, just focuses on the particular area God might be wanting to work on in each of our lives. Okay with that? And then a little further on, just to wrap up, I'm going to read Ephesians 2, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 22. It talks about putting off and putting on. It says, uh, you, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your, of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we long to become just like you, like you in character and speech and actions. And so we invite you this morning, have your way in our lives, whatever it takes, Lord. If it involves going through hardship, just do it, Lord, if that's what it takes to, to form your character, to make us mature, to make us like you. We pray that you will shine your searchlight on those particular areas in our life which need dealing with. We know that, as it says in Ephesians, just a little later down, um, whatever uh, your light shines on becomes illuminated and somehow becomes healed and, and like you. So won't you shine your loving searchlight on those areas which are yet somewhat dark, needing an overhaul, needing to be made more mature and more like you. Help us in this for your glory's sake and to you, be the glory in the church, Lord Jesus. Amen.